We're going through the book of Exodus, uh, Calvary Chapel Distinctive, as we go verse by verse through whatever book we're in. And so we've been looking at the book of Exodus, a lot of amazing things we've seen. And um, as we'll see today, we're going to start talking about the tent of God, the tabernacle of God. But uh, throughout history, you know, there have been some amazing structures built. Uh, some are very tall, some are very uh, elaborate. Some have stood for thousands of years, and in many ways are just a testament to the ingenuity of mankind, the creativity of mankind. But there are two structures that I believe stand above the rest, and one of them we're going to look at this morning, we'll start to look at it. It's the tabernacle of God, and then about 500 years later, we have the Temple of Solomon. And the reason they stand out above the rest is because God's presence actually dwelt there. God manifested himself there. He dwelt among his people uh, in these places. Now, the next seven chapters are God's instructions about the tabernacle. Some refer to it as the tent of God. Uh, he will give Moses blueprints about the tabernacle and all the furnishings that would be in the tabernacle. And so these next seven chapters are the result of Moses going to the top of Mount Sinai. He will be there for 40 days and 40 nights. Um, and he will get all these instructions as he's in the midst of the cloud of glory. Now, Joshua, he will be there the entire 40 days and 40 nights just below not sure how far below, but below where Moses is. Uh, Aaron and his sons and the 70 elders originally were up there, but they will go down before that time is over, and they'll be back with the people who are camped out at the base of Mount Sinai. So again, chapters 25 to 31 are heavenly blueprints of what God wants Moses to make when he goes back down the mountain. The tent, the curtains, and the furniture. And some of you might be thinking, oh, great, there's nothing more than I hate than going curtain and furniture shopping. But hopefully you'll get a lot more out of these chapters than just looking at, you know, the weekly ad for American Furniture Warehouse. Um, these chapters should be anything but boring. Um, I, I heard about this letter to the editor that was published in a local newspaper years ago. It was titled, Why I'm Giving Up on Church. So in the letter, this man writes, I've been going to church for 30 years. I've probably listened to more than 10,000 sermons. And for the life of me, I can't remember the details from any one sermon. I'm starting to think that church might be a waste of time. And the pastors are wasting their time preaching the Bible. Well, he got a big response. And there was a lot of people that wrote in supporting, you know, going to church. Others were agreeing with the guy. But one letter really stood out. This other man wrote, I've been married for 30 years, and my wife has cooked me more than 20,000 meals. And for the life of me, I can't remember the menu or all the ingredients she used in any one of those meals. But I know this, without all those meals, I would have starved and died. Those meals nourished and strengthened me. So too, every Sunday, God sets a table at church, and the Bible has enhanced and nourished my life. And without God's word... I would be empty and malnourished and weak and confused and spiritually dead. I think that's a great response to that letter. God's Word is living, God's Word is powerful, and it cuts right into our hearts and into our minds. Now, let me give you the three most important truths about why it's necessary to study these chapters when it comes to the tabernacle. Number one is, everything we see in the tabernacle points to Jesus Christ. Everything in this, it reveals his purpose, his work, and his mission. Knowing these things will help us understand why Jesus came from heaven to earth 2,000 years ago. Hebrews 11, or 9-11, says this, But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come, with the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. So keep that in mind uh, as we go through this. Every detail, every material, all the furnishings, they all speak of Jesus, his life, his ministry, and his sacrifice for our sins upon the cross. Uh, the second thing we'll see about the tabernacle is from the outside, it was not very glamorous at all. In fact, from the outward appearance, it was just very plain. 
Uh, we'll see there was a big fence around the whole complex. Um, there was various animal sk skins that covered the tabernacle itself. And so again, it was very plain, very common looking tent. But again, it speaks of Jesus because on the outside, he was very normal looking. He was just a human being. He was a Jew. He was able to blend in with all the other Jews there, all the Jewish men there. He was not a blonde hair, blue-eyed Hollywood type of guy, as some movies portray him. You know, he didn't have a halo above his head. He did not glow in the dark. In fact, he was a very Jewish man that says that he could just blend in with the people when he wanted to. Isaiah 53, 2 says of Jesus, for he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness, I mean splendor, and when we see him, there is no beauty or appearance that we should desire him. In other words, he would grow up, he would live in a very normal human body. So on the outside, the tabernacle looked rather plain and simple, but on the inside, it's a whole different story. When we look at it starting next week, the inside curtain, the first layer inside the tabernacle, it was very beautifully embroidered. The veil was embroidered. Uh, all the furnishings are overlaid with pure gold. I mean, it was amazing, but nobody could see it. It was all on the inside. But the most important thing is God would dwell within the Holy of Holies. Again, the same is true of Jesus. On the outside, very plain and simple, but on the inside of his body, his tabernacle dwelt, as Colossians say, well, the fullness of the Godhead in bodily form. I mean, God the Son was with us. Emmanuel, God with us. Amazing. When he returns at his second coming, he is coming back not as the meek and mild Lamb of God, but as the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Uh, we see a glimpse of his glory when he's on the Mount of Transfiguration. He uh, took Peter, James, and John up there. Elijah and Moses appear to him, and then he is transformed. He begins to shine, it says, as the sun in its appearance. His clothes were, it says, white as light. But that was just a little glimpse of the glory within. The third interesting thing about the tabernacle is this. It was not built to house people. It was not a gathering place for the people. There were no chairs in the tabernacle. Nobody could sit down but it was a place where everybody inside that was allowed inside had to work very hard, very diligently. We'll see that only Moses and Aaron and his sons and a few other priests down the road would be allowed to go inside it. As I mentioned earlier, only the high priest would be allowed to go into the Holy of Holies, and that was only once a year, and that was on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, where the blood of the Lamb would be sprinkled on the mercy seat. More about that in a moment. All the other people, they had to be outside. They could not even enter in through those that, the fencing around it. Now, there's a contrast here because the law was very much like that. Under the law, nobody rested. You couldn't rest in the Lord because the law made you work. They're striving, they're struggling, their hardest to try to maintain or try to gain acceptance from God. And they were working so hard, but they could not ever achieve. But then you look at Jesus. He did all the work himself. He fulfilled the law completely. He said on the cross, it is finished. He paid the price in full. Hebrews 10, verse 12 says this, But this man, speaking of Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. In other words, he finished the work. He was able to rest and sit down. So concerning our salvation, there's nothing we can add to our salvation. We can't add to his perfect sacrifice. But now we get to rest. We get to rest in the Lord. And some of you might, before we're done, start resting in the Lord. And that's okay. You know, at least you're here. Um, okay, look at these pictures. Put up a couple pictures here. This is uh, kind of the overview from the top, looking down at the tabernacle. You see the fencing around it. It's 75 feet up and down, 150 feet, you know, the two parallel lines going this way. And, um, and then you'd have, as you came in from the right side, there's a 30-foot opening there. You had the altar there for sacrifice, and that's we'll look at that later. And then you have the bronze laver. That's where they would wash their hands. And then you go into where it says holy, and then most holy, that's the actual tabernacle. 
It was divided into two uh, places. You had the holy place, it was called, and that's where we'll see a few of the things this morning. There was the table of showbread on the right, and on the left was the menorah, the lampstand, and then you'd go through the veil, and the only thing in the holy of holies, where it says most holy, also known as the holy of holies, is the Ark of the Covenant, and we'll see that here in a moment. Um, the uh, measurements of the Holy of Holies was 15 by 15 by 15. It's a cube. Uh, it might remind you of what we read in the book of Revelation when it gives the measurements of the holy city of New Jerusalem. It's 1,500 miles square, 1,500 miles high, deep, and wide. It's a cube. And in the middle of it was the throne of God and the Lamb. So really, New Jerusalem is the real deal, and this is a model that God is giving Moses to build. The other picture, uh, kind of a rend, you know, artist rendition of it. You have the curtains all around. They're about eight feet high, so most people aren't looking over it. They can't see in even. They might see the top of it. They'd see the smoke going up from different things, but it was not for the people to gather in. So let's take a look, chapter 25. Verse 1 says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, that they may bring me an offering from everyone who gives it willingly. With his heart you shall take my offering. And this is the offering which you shall take from them, gold, silver, and bronze, blue, purple, and scarlet thread, fine linen, and goat's hair. Everybody's got that laying around, right? Ram skins, dyed red, Badger skins, some versions will say pork, or, um, uh, seal skins, uh, and acacia wood, very important, oil for the light, and spices for the anointing oil and for the sweet incense, onyx stones and stones to be set in the ephod, that would be the breastplate that Aaron would wear, and in the breastplate, in the ephod and in the breastplate, so those stones, so few things that are important to take note of. First of all, God tells Moses, speak to the children of Israel. And it literally means ask the children of Israel. He's not saying demand them to give these things. He says, ask them to give these things to the tabernacle building program, you might say. And notice this offering was only to come from those who had a willing heart to give. Now, do you remember where they got all this wealth? Because they were 400 years slaves in Egypt. But it was after the ninth plague that God was sending upon the Egyptians. After that plague, he tells Moses, tell all the people, go to your Egyptian neighbors and ask them for gold, silver, and you know all their, their clothing. And by this time, the Egyptians are freaked out by the Hebrew God. And they're like loading them up with all, I mean, literally, I mean, tons of stuff. And they carried out massive amounts of gold, silver, and all these different linens, clothing, and all these things that will be used for the building of this tabernacle. So God is putting the Israelites to the test here. Uh, he's not demanding they give to this tabernacle building program, but he's simply asking them to give. In other words, do the people really want God to dwell in their midst? We'll see. This is a place he says, I will dwell among you. Do they realize that God will continue to meet all their needs? Or are they going to get gritty and say, oh, man, I deserve this. We were slaves, so this is my stuff. Instead of realizing, no, God has provided all that we need. I love how God asks them to give from a willing heart because unlike so many preachers and pastors who lay guilt trips or use manipulative words, they put up thermometers on the stage or they might sell you a brick <laughs> or they'll sell you a chair. They come up with all kinds of gimmicks to try to get people to give. You know, God just wants us to give from a willing heart. And, and that's a pattern we see throughout the word of God. Um, that's what God laid on my heart when we started this church nearly 35 years ago. Don't beg for money. Don't even ask for money. We never have. I mean, the most you'll ever hear, and I never say it, but when John's giving announcements, once in a while he'll say, uh, we have agape boxes in the foyer for your tithes and offerings. And that's all you're going to hear. You know, I grew up, you know, Pastor Chuck harped on it every year at the pastor's conference where God guides, God provides. 
And so that's we just trust the Lord. He's always met our needs, and it's only when the Holy Spirit puts it within our hearts to give that the Lord says, now give to this, and he, he works in our hearts to give. Same like with what Jody was just sharing. You know, we're not begging anybody to give, but if the Lord puts it on your heart, this is a great way you can give, and the Lord can use that. Because when we give a little, God can use it for much. So, why does God say to give from a willing heart? Because God wants it to be a place of worship, not a place of manipulation. Therefore, He wants our giving to be a reflection of our relationship with Jesus. And for that to be real, or to have any value at all, it has to involve a choice that we make. It must come from a willing heart. God did not create us to be robots. He didn't say, you know, you're a robot, push a button. Thank you, God. I love you, God. Thank you, God. I love you. I mean, that's not a relationship with God. He didn't create us without a free will. So for there to be meaning in our giving, it must come from a heart that simply loves God, not as manipulated by Him or forced to do anything against His will. We see, again, this pattern throughout the Bible. The Apostle Paul says it like this in 2 Corinthians 9, verse 7. So let each one, have, uh, let each one give as he purposes in his heart. Not grudgingly, you know, in other words, not because somebody's twisting your arm or of necessity, given, you, you'll get back. You know, the word of faith does that all the time. You give and God will give you a hundredfold back. And they misquote God's word to try to manipulate people to give more so they'll get more. And that's not the reason why we give. For God loves a cheerful giver. Uh, again, God certainly doesn't need our money. I mean, he could make money out of thin air if he wanted to. Unlike our government, which is making money out of thin air, <laughs> our, government's near, our government's nearly $34 trillion in debt. God will be a debtor to no one. But our giving to the Lord out of a joyful heart, a willing heart, is simply a reflection of our love and worship for the Lord. It's also a sign of our trust in the Lord. In other words, it shows that we really believe that God is going to take care of us, that God will meet our needs as only He can. Philippians 4.19 says, And my God shall supply all your need, not greed, all your need according to His riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Now look at verse 8. This is one of the key verses. I hope you underline this. It says, And let them make me a sanctuary Here's the reason why, that I may dwell among them. Awesome. God is making this incredible statement. Make me a sanctuary, and I'll, I'm going to dwell in your midst. And that's the overriding purpose of the tabernacle. God would dwell with his people. And at that moment, at, at this time, the Israelites are literally dwelling in hundreds of thousands of tents. There's like two and a half to three million Israelites here in the wilderness around Mount Sinai, and they are in tents. So there's hundreds of thousands of tents, and it's almost like God is saying, you've got a tent? I want a tent. You know, he's not saying build this giant monument to me, but I just want to dwell close to you. I want to share in fellowship with you. Again, this is so different than all the pagan gods that the Gentiles are worshiping. I mean, their god was distant. Their god was always mean. He was always angry. And it was, they weren't even real gods because they were just, you know, things Satan came up with for people to worship. But the one true God is so different. He lived with them. He lived among them. Uh, his pillar of fire would be there at night. His pillar of cloud would be there throughout the day. And in their entire 40-year journey, he watched over them. He protected them. And he provided all that they would need. They didn't have any natural resources in the wilderness for 40 years. He gave them manna from heaven every day, water from the rock. He gave them clothes that never wore out, Teva sandals that never wore out. After 40 years, it says, their sandals didn't even wear out. And the shocking truth to all the pagans was that the God of the Hebrews was in their midst. And the only time that God would be closer to his people was when Jesus came from heaven to earth and tabernacled among us in his human body. Emmanuel, they would call him, God with us. This is why we read in John 1.14. And the Word, you know, remember the Word was with God, the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt, and that word literally means tabernacled among us. And we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace 
and truth. So as God the Son, Jesus dwelt among his people. This is why verses are so important. Like this verse, John 14, verse 9, Philip says, show us the Father, and that'll be sufficient. That'll be good, wouldn't it? Yeah, show us God. So Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? In other words, if you want to know what God's like, you look at Jesus. You want to know how he... Uh, thinks of you, you look at Jesus. If you want to know what God's plan is for your life, you look at Jesus. I mean, it's all wrapped up in Jesus. God was tabernacling, among, I guess that's a word, tabernacling. <laughs> we'll go with that. God was tabernacling among us for 33 years, three and a half years in his uh, ministry among the people. And so here we see God wanting to dwell with his people. And I hope you realize it's also true for you and me today. He wants you to know he will be with you always. He, sa he says, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'm with you always to the end of this age. He he's basically telling us, I will be there during your good times. I'll be there with you during your difficult days. Whatever you encounter, I am there with you. And I am so blessed just knowing that God is with me always. He's always watching over me. He's always watching out for me. And it's simply because he loves me and he loves you as well. So, Make me a sanctuary, I will dwell among them. Verse 9, according to all that I show you, that is the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all its furnishings, just so you, just so you shall make it. In other words, God is making it very clear to Moses. This is the pattern. Don't deviate from it. You don't add to what I'm going to show you. You don't take away from what I'm going to show you. You don't take artistic liberties with this tabernacle you just do what i called you to do what i show you just follow my design and it's amazing and again this pattern is a model for new jerusalem and by the way that's how we are to be living our christian lives just follow the pattern God has given us. That is his word. You want to know what God thinks of marriage? You read the word of God. How to raise a family? You read the word of God. How to do church? It's in the word of God. If you want to find joy and peace in your life and victory over the world, our flesh and the devil, you follow the pattern of God's word. So, um, hopefully quickly, we will look at the three first things. Before they build the tabernacle itself, he's going to tell them the very first thing you're going to build is the Ark of the Covenant. This is really the heart of this whole thing God's telling them to build. So look at this picture here. This is the Ark, kind of. That's not the Ark. Ask Indiana Jones where it is. I don't know. But, you know, this is kind of a representation of what the ark may look like. Some have the poles going the other direction, but be that as it may, uh, look at verse 10. So they shall make an ark of acacia wood. Two and a half cubits shall be its length. And you're going to see that word cubit, cubits a lot in this section. This is one of the reasons why so many people bog down when they go through the Old Testament. It's like, oh my gosh, why do they keep repeating these words? Well, God was making it very clear. This is what you're supposed to do. Uh, two and a half cubits shall be its length, a cubit and a half its width, and a cubit and a half its height. You shall overlay it with pure gold. Inside and out, you shall overlay it and shall make of it a molding of gold all around. So again, this is the very first thing he tells them to build, the Ark of the Covenant. Notice it's made from acacia wood. Acacia wood is a very hard wood. It only grows out in the deserts of the Middle East. Well, they replanted them in other places, but back then that's where they grew. There's a very hard wood. Um, they would use this for building a lot of things that needed to last a long time. And so... This would speak of the humanity of Christ. You know, the, it's just plain wood. But notice it's then overlaid. It says with pure gold, this would speak of the deity of Christ. When acacia wood was pierced, if you just poked a hole in it or, you know, a nail, pull it out, it would ooze out this gummy-like substance, and it has some healing properties. Similar to Jesus, he was pierced through, right? Isaiah 53, 5 says of Jesus, but he was wounded, literally means pierced through for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. 
Now, again, it talks about all these cubits. Um, a cubit in that day, well, I guess even today, it, it's a measurement from your elbow to the tip of your finger. The average cubit is about 18 inches from your elbow to your fingertip. So this arc is approximately four feet wide, two feet deep, and two feet high. Verse 12. You shall cast four rings of gold for it. You can put the picture back up there, and you can see those round rings. And put them in its four corners. Two rings shall be on one side and two rings on the other side. And you shall make poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. And so those are supposed to be overlaid with gold. I can't really tell that shows it on there. You shall put poles into the rings on the sides of the ark that the ark may be carried by them. The poles shall be in the rings of the ark. They shall not be taken from it. So the poles always remain in there. And the same with other things we'll look at here in a moment. Um, that's because the, this had to be very portable. And the whole structure, the the fencing around it, everything with the tabernacle. It all had to be able to be rolled up quickly and then carried, never carted. It had to be carried. Whenever the glory cloud moved, they had to move with it. And so that's why everything will have these poles and these you know rings through them to be carried, not carted. You remember what happened to David uh, when David... Uh, the, the Philistines captured the ark, and God, you know, started cursing the Philistines because they were doing things with the ark. And then they like, we're going to send it back. So they send it back. And then David's all excited. He goes out there, and they put it on this cart, and they start bringing it back to Jerusalem. And the cart wobbles, and this guy named Uzzah puts his hand on the ark to stop it from falling. Sounds innocent enough, and God strikes him dead. And then David's like, what's going on here? So he studies the word, the pattern. The, cart, uh, uh, the, the implements, and especially this, could never be carted by an animal pulling it. It always had to be carried. And so once David realized that, he goes back to the word, oh, we got to carry this thing. And so I can't remember how many steps it was like, take, take 10 steps, they'd sacrifice an animal. Takes 10 more steps, sacrifice an animal. He kind of went overboard. But they finally bring it into Israel, back to Jerusalem. Be that as it may, uh, look at verse 16. It tells us here, and you shall put into the ark the testimony which I will give you. So again, the first thing that will go inside that, because that lid's removed, is the two tablets of stone that um, we'll find out later. God writes on the tablets of stone with his finger the Ten Commandments. Now, this needs a lid, and you see the lid there. It's called the mercy seat. Look at verse 17. You shall make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two and a half cubits shall be its length, and a cubit and a half its width. So it's just the same dimensions, four feet by two feet, on top of this, and it's called the mercy seat. And this is very important because a lot of people try their hardest to meet with God by trying to keep the law, by trying to keep the Ten Commandments, as you know, that is impossible. Nobody can keep God's law because God's law is perfect and we're not. But here we see that God places the mercy seat over the law. The law is inside. The mercy seat would go above it. What they put on the mercy seat? Once a year in the Day of Atonement, they would sprinkle the blood of the lamb on this mercy seat. That represents Jesus, a beautiful picture of Jesus. He is the mercy seat. His blood was sprinkled. He is superior to the law. Again, John 1.17 says, For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So he fulfilled the law for us. Since the tabernacle is a model of New Jerusalem, the Ark of the Covenant is like the very throne of God. And so what does Paul tell us? I think it's Paul. I'll go with Paul. Hebrews 4.16. Whoever wrote Hebrews said this, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. That's really the mercy seat, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So very important to have that mercy seat. Look at verse 18. And you shall make two cherubim of gold. You see those on the picture there. 
uh, of hammered work. You shall make them at the two ends of the mercy seat. Make one cherub at one end, the other at the other end. You shall make the cherubim at the two ends of it of one piece with the mercy seat. And the cherubim shall stretch out their wings above. Notice in the picture, cover the mercy seat with their wings, and they shall face one another. The faces of the cherubim shall be toward the mercy seat. So looking down, you shall put the mercy seat on top of the ark, and in the ark you shall put the testimony that I will give you. Again, the Ten Commandments. So later on, what do they add to the Ark of the Covenant? They'll have the two tablets of stone, then they put in the jar of manna, and then they put in what? Aaron's rod, his staff that budded almonds, even though it's a staff he'd carried around for years, God brought it to life, so to speak. But all three items that go in here represent two things. God's provision, he gave them the law, which is perfect. He gave them the manna from heaven. He, you know, raised up, you know, Aaron to be the high priest. But it also represents man's utter failure. Because man could not keep the law. Man grumbled and complained against the man. Is that all we get? But manna bread, I'm tired of this stuff. I'm tired of manna cotty. Give me something new. And they were grumbling against God. So that goes in there. And then also Aaron's rod that budded. We, we should have more leaders than just Moses and Aaron. They complained against Moses and Aaron. And so God, you know, we'll see that later. I mean, God will strike down Korah and his rebels. But these two cherubim, notice they're facing each other around God's throne. They're in glory. There's four cherubim. They circle the throne of God day and night. Well, not day and night. All the time, because there's no day and night there. They circle the throne of God, and they're constantly saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And they just praise and worship God continuously. So, inside the ark, we see man's failure, but it was on the mercy seat. We see the blood of the lamb that would cover their sins. So, again, another beautiful picture of Jesus. We fail, but God sent his son to shed his blood for us. Look at verse 22. And there I will meet with you, and I will speak with you from above the mercy seat from between the two cherubim which are on the ark of the testimony, about everything which I give you in commandment to the children of Israel. And so it's at the mercy seat where God and Moses would be able to have fellowship. And even though Moses could not meet with God by trying to live up to the Ten Commandments, by trying to live up to the law, it was at the place of mercy and grace where God would meet with him, the mercy seat. That's true for us. Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, not by trying to keep the law. That's the works he's referring to. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. So we come freely to the throne room of God's grace because he has forgiven us of all of our sins. Now, we see an interesting picture of this mercy seat in the New Testament, and it's when Mary Magdalene, first one to show up at the tomb of Jesus, expecting to see, you know, the tomb there, but the tomb had already, the stone had already been rolled away, and it says that she looked inside, and what does she see? John 20, verse 12, and she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the foot, feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. And I can imagine just some of the blood maybe on that slab in between the two angels. Beautiful picture of the mercy seat. But praise the Lord, he is now risen from the grave. The second item we're going to look at, and we'll wrap it up here shortly, is the table of showbread. So that's a pretty good rendition of what the table of showbread may have looked like. You'll see different you know, pictures of it. But um, this is what we read, 20, uh, verse 23. You shall also make a table of acacia wood. So you see acacia wood, acacia wood, acacia wood. My granddaughter's name is Acacia. Bethany said, how come you didn't say anything about acacia? For Well, I don't want to embarrass her. So I guess I can now. I mean, that's they were trying to come up with a name, and they're looking at different trees. What about aspen? What about willow? You know, and it's like, nah. So we thought it kicked out. What about acacia? And we start thinking more about it. It's like, yeah, acacia wood, strong, sturdy, stubborn, maybe. Um, so acacia, 
But, you know, it's just plain wood. But it's what's overlaid is the pure gold. You know, what's so awesome about Acacia, <laughs> she loves Jesus. That's the key. That's why I didn't talk about it for service. Good grief. Anyway, I know. So you shall make for a frame, verse 25, a hand breadth all around. Uh, you shall make a gold molding for the frame all around, and you shall make it for uh, make for it four rings of gold, again the rings, and put the rings on the four corners that are at its four legs. The rings shall be close uh, close to the frame as holders for the poles to be a, uh, to bear the table. And you shall make the poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold that the table may be carried with them. And again, it says in verse 29, you shall make its dishes, its pans, its pitchers, its bowls for pouring you shall make them of pure gold, and you shall set the showbread on the table before me always. And so again, as you come into the tabernacle, uh, on the very right side, as you go into the holy place, you'd have this on one side, on the other side would be the menorah that we'll talk about in a moment. And you had this table of showbread, it was approximately three feet long, and about 18 inches deep, and about two feet tall. Each week they would put 12 loaves of bread, unleavened bread, six on each side as it shows here, and that represented the 12 tribes of Israel. This would um, have a few significant meanings. For the Jews, this was a constant reminder that God would always be their provider. He would sustain them not only through the 40 years in the wilderness, but he would sustain them throughout their uh, coming into the promised land of Israel. Uh, God was always going to meet their needs. Uh, again, as Philippians 4.19 says, And my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. That name, showbread, means bread of faces, and it can also be translated bread of presence. And it was eating God's presence in his house as his guest. And every week they would take this out, the priest could eat it, and then they replace it with freshly baked bread. But it was always that reminder that God was in fellowship with them. When you ate a meal with someone, as I mentioned before, in that culture, if you ate with someone, it means you were in fellowship. If you didn't like somebody, you would not eat a meal with them. You wouldn't take them out to dinner. You wouldn't go out for falafel or shawarma or anything else. You would avoid them because that man, I don't want to fellowship with that guy. They're bad. They're this. They're that. Jesus comes along and he eats with sinners and tax collectors. As I've said, if he didn't eat with sinners, he would be eating every meal alone. But he joined into fellowship with us. And that's a, a beautiful picture of this. Um, John 6.35, it says, And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. So here's another picture of Jesus. He who comes to me shall never hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. Again, he, can only, he alone can provide what we really need. Only he can satisfy a hungry soul, a thirsty soul. He who believes in me shall never thirst. Remember the woman at the well? You know, she had been through five husbands, living with a guy that's not her husband. And, you know, she's getting in this little debate with Jesus. And, you know, Jesus tells her, whoever drinks of this water, you're going to thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water I give them, no, you'll never thirst again because he's the living water. He's the one that gives us eternal life. Okay, finally, the third item God instructs Moses to make is the gold Lamp stand here. Oh, there you go. That's the one in Israel, right? In Jerusalem. Yeah, this is a cool one because this thing's in case. Many of us saw it last March when we were there. This is right. I think is it Ben Yehuda Street? Is that where that was located? It's in Jerusalem, uh, pretty close to the Wailing Wall. But this is made by the uh, Temple Institute. They've made most everything for. Uh, the rebuilding of the temple. They're expecting, they're hoping to build the temple. And this thing's in a big, you know, plexiglass thing, but you can see it there. Um, we saw it when we were there last March. And it's pretty cool because that's 45 pounds of gold. That's a lot of gold. I mean, do the math. I don't know, a million and a half or so. That's, that's a lot of gold. But this is the only light inside 
the tabernacle, the whole tabernacle is 45 by 15. And this is the only light there. Because remember, that it's going to have four coverings over it. And with all those coverings, the last one is like, you know, the skins of animals, water sealant. But it's pitch black in there. You wouldn't see anything. And so this is the only thing that lit up the tabernacle, made of pure gold. Um, oh, i got to read this first. Let's look at verse 31. And it says, You shall also make a lampstand of pure gold. The lampstand shall be of hammered work. I like that word, hammered work. Its shaft, its branches, its bowls, its ornamental knobs, and flowers shall be one piece. And six branches shall come out of its sides, three branches of the lampstand out of one side, three branches of the lampstand out of the other side. So you got one in the middle, so seven total. Three bowls shall be made like almond blossoms on one branch with an ornamental knob and a flower, and three bowls like an almond blossoms on the other branch with the, an ornamental knob and a flower. And so for the six branches that come out of the lampstand. On the lampstand itself, four bowls shall be made like almond blossoms, each with its ornamental knob and flower. And there shall be a knob under the first two branches of the same, a knob under the second two branches of the same, and a knob under the third two branches of the same. According to the six branches that extend from the lampstand, their knobs and their branches shall be of one piece. All of it shall be one hammered piece of pure gold. That's a lot. You shall make seven lamps for it, and they shall arrange its lamps so that they give light in front of it. And its wick trimmers and their tray shall be of pure gold. It shall be made of a talent of pure gold. So this one's 45 pounds. What's a talent? About 75 to 80 pounds. That's what was in the tabernacle. And see to it that you make them according to the pattern which was shown you on the mountain. Uh, King James, Old King James says candlesticks. They never had any candlesticks in this thing. It was always to be lit by 100% pure virgin olive oil. And that's they had wicks in there. And that was one of the jobs of the high priest. You'd have to trim the wicks, keep the oil uh, full at all times, because that thing burned 24-7 in the tabernacle. That was, you know, to burn continuously. This lampstand, it pictures a, a, a few different things. Number one is, again, it's a beautiful picture of Jesus. Why do I say that? Because he is the light of the world. John 8, 12. Then Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Second thing is, this is a beautiful picture of the Holy Spirit. In Revelation 1, 7, we see that there are seven spirits before the throne of God. Seven on the candle, or lampstand, not candlestick, seven is how many you know, bowls there were on the lampstand. That's a picture of you know, the Holy Spirit. Number seven is a number of perfection, completeness. So in Revelation 1, 4, when it talks about the seven lampstands before the Lord, it's the Holy Spirit in all of his fullness, shining brightly. Um, in Zechariah chapter 4, Zechariah is given this vision of the lampstand, but then he sees these gold pipes that are tapped into these two olive trees, and it's like an automated system where it's filling it up naturally. And so what does the Lord tell him? This is the word for Zerubbabel. It's not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. It's the Holy Spirit that gives us the ability to live out our Christian lives for the Lord. And then the third picture is this. We are also called to be light in this dark world. Jesus says, you are the light of the world. We need the power of the Holy Spirit to live a life that brings glory and honor to the Lord and not to ourselves. Matthew 5.16 says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven, and it's only possible for us to do any kind of good work for the Lord in the power of the Spirit, because if we're doing it in our own flesh, it's not a good work. We're drawing attention to ourselves and not pointing people to Jesus. Finally, notice how this lampstand was shaped by, twice it says, being hammered. Now, you hear people say, oh man, I got hammered last night. No, that's not what he's talking about. 
That's, that's a bad thing. You don't want to be hammered. No, but for the Lord, he brings out a few different things when he's working on our lives. A hammer can be one of them. You know, he's done that on my life a few times, but what is he doing? When he hammers us, like he's hammering this, it's to mold us and shape us into the Christians he wants us to be. you got to be yielding to the Lord. What does he want to do in your life? It's not my life. I belong to him. He bought me with a price, his blood, so I'm no longer my own. Another great picture. Oh, I love this one. He prunes us. It says there in John 15, 5, apart from me, you can do nothing. But then it even says about the, the pruning process, there'll be a branch in our life, it's producing fruit. And it says, he'll lop it off. Why? Because he wants it to produce more fruit. You might be thinking, Lord, that was fruitful. Why'd you cut it off? That hurts. Because he's molding us and shaping us. One of my favorites is, we're just a little lump of clay. And he's the potter. And for all of you that have worked with clay or, you know, watch potters work, you know, they'll put that lump of clay on there, it's spinning around, and you're feeling like, man, I'm getting dizzy in this world. I'm just spinning around, and the potter puts his hands on you, he gets it all wet and gooey, and he puts, he puts pressure on you. He's pushing as he's molding these vessels into what he wants them to be. That's what he's doing in our lives. Is he mad at us? No. Is he disappointed in you? No. He knows everything about us. But when we yield to him, he will mold us and shape us into the men and women that he wants us to be. He's conforming us more and more into his image and likeness. So yield to the Lord and let him work in you and through you and see to it that you make them according to the pattern which was shown you on the mountain. What we have in God's word. This is the pattern we follow. Let him Oh. 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 Oh.